All right, Acts 17. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis, I did practice this. (laughs) I didn't read it this morning, so I didn't get it. Okay. Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them, which is Paul and Silas, out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, My name is Jonathan Perez. I am the Director of Justice and Mercy here at this wonderful, amazing church called Life Church of Charlotte. Um, Man, I love you guys. I love my church. I love this job. I love the elders. I love the I love everyone here. If I if I haven't met you, I want to to love you. Um, Invite me to lunch. Hey, and I'll love you even more. Um, As director of Justice and Mercy, man, we get to essentially just bring the kingdom of heaven to the city of Charlotte. Um, Here at this church, we have what we call a three-mile radius. And we really believe, I mean, we wholeheartedly believe that one day we are going to stand before the maker of heaven and earth, and we're going to give an account as a church on how we treated our three-mile radius, how we treated our neighbors. And so we love our neighbors. We want to make the city a better place. And one of the ways, I'm going I'm to advertise for something right now, so I'm going to let you know, this is my pitch. Um, one of the ways we do that is we have a beautiful, wonderful, amazing sports camp called Queen City Sports Camp. If you've never heard of Queen City Sports, oh my gosh, it is heaven on earth. Basically, what we did last year was we decided to have this amazing sports camp, and we opened it to the community, and we made it free, and we made it fun, and we gave them breakfast and lunch and memories, and it was so cool. We had 175 kids come out last year. Um, Of those 175, all of them got to hear the gospel every day, and 11 of them were saved. And so last year, so last year, Queen City Sports Camp was really a bridge to to get into our neighborhood. Well, we're we're in certain neighborhoods now. Man, we're doing a lot of good work. If you guys have seen, like, kids running around, they're coming from from those neighborhoods. We've got to baptize three of them in the past month. Um, There's one little kid who's like, how do I become a member? (laughs) And so they're no longer going to be children of the community. They're, They're children of our church. They're our family. And this year, I'm proud to announce that we're doing the camp again. We're expecting... 550 to 750 kids. So here's the pitch to you. We've partnered with other churches. Uh, Our ascending church is is coming down here. We have 90 volunteers that aren't Life Church members, but we definitely need more and more hands. And so if you want to have a great weekend of fun, sharing the faith, reaching the community, sharing the gospel, seeing lives transformed, then man, do I have a camp for you. 
Uh, and so we, we need volunteers. We need people to show up. If you can't help during the week, we're going to be making sandwiches because we got to feed these kids. So we're going to need your help. And also, if you just want to get involved with what we're doing in the community, if you want to get involved with the tutoring program we're helping with, uh, the Sunday morning thing we're doing with, with the middle school kids, uh, if you want to get involved with the schools, we're having an interest meeting this Thursday, June 1st. And so that QR code, that beautiful QR code, will, will get you all the information you need. So if you're interested in signing up for camp, please, we need all the help. Come see Lives Transform. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm going to lead us into prayer because we love prayer here. Uh, and all my intercessors in the room, just pray with me. Uh, that The Spirit would, would fill this room. Oh, hi to the balcony. <laughs> I've never been up here where the balcony was built, so... All, all the saints up there, you guys look great. Let's pray. Father, you are so kind and you are so gracious. And Lord, I pray that the spirit would move in this room. Father, I pray for the brokenhearted in this room. I pray for all of those who are afraid, Lord. God, thank you so much for sending your son. God, we get to worship you together as a family. We get to sing songs, and Lord, we get to hear from your word. And so, Lord, guard my heart. Cleanse me of any unrighteousness. God, speak to me the message you want these people to hear. God, care for your flock. In the name of Jesus, your son, I pray. Amen. I read two contrasting stories this week, and and I just want to share both of them with you. Uh, The first story was from John Tyson. He's the pastor of the Church of the New York City. And and when Tyson was in his mid-20s, he actually got involved in church planting in the nation of Kyrgyzstan. Now, Kyrgyzstan is one of the places of the part of the world where there's not many believers and where most Westerners wouldn't even dare to go. Tyson had a friend who was involved in ministry there, and after uh, the fall of communism, there was really a need for the gospel to be spread, for churches to be planted, and so his friend would send missionaries to the nation of Kyrgyzstan. When John finally went to Kyrgyzstan, he got connected with a group of university students and young adults who were planting churches all across universities and campuses in this hostile and dangerous nation. Tyson was so moved by these college students from Kyrgyzstan that he got a group of his own college students and young adults from his church back in the States, to get, and together they all went to the nation of Kyrgyzstan to help with the mission, encourage the college church planters, and John Tyson's ultimate hope was that the U.S. college students would get their hearts stirred up by the college students in Kyrgyzstan. On the final night of the trip, Tyson and the U.S. college students gathered with the leaders who were overseeing the church, uh, the church movie, movement and the house churches. And so they just went around the room and they asked the leaders one by one what their faith meant to them. Somewhere in the conversation, Tyson asked the leaders this question, had they ever experienced any persecution at all for their faith? There was kind of a chuckle in the room from all the leaders. They were trying not to scoff and make fun of John, Americans. And so one by one, they all replied and they said, of course we've experienced persecution. This comes with following Jesus. Didn't Jesus tell us that we would experience persecution in this life? And so Tyson asked what sort of persecution they did experience. And one of them said that they were physically beaten by by their family members. Another one said they were disowned and cut off from their family. And, and, And one by one, they just went around sharing how much following Jesus had cost them everything. And yet, despite the fear despite the turmoil, in the midst of all the pain and all the suffering, they did it with joy. And all of them accepted this as a normal and expected part of their discipleship to Jesus. 
And in that moment, Tyson realized what a great opportunity it was for these young United States college students. Man, they were able to sit at the foot of these martyrs and, and to listen and to experience what it was like to, to be persecuted for your faith as followers of Jesus. Fast forward several years, and one of the most heartbreaking things happened. Some of those students who sat in that room and saw and heard these inspiring stories fell away from Jesus and abandoned their faith when things got hard in their lives. For whatever reason, when the outside pressure became too much, life either became too confusing or too challenging, these college students did not endure and they walked away from Jesus. Now, that's the first story. Let's breathe a little bit, okay? I was introduced these last months to a guy named Jamie Winship. If you've never heard of Jamie Winship, oh my gosh, his testimony is crazy. I was actually introduced to him by uh, Hannah Terry. Can you guys give a big round of applause to Hannah? <laughs> Hannah makes sourdough. And she introduced sourdough to my wife. Dude, she's amazing. Um, Hannah, if, if you're like a college student who's a girl or like just about to enter the workplace and you need a mentor, I'm sorry, Hannah, I'm putting you on the spot, but <laughs> go buy Hannah lunch or coffee and just go meet with her and sit under her feet. Like she has been a blessing to our, our life group. Thank you, Hannah, for this story too. Anyway, so I was introduced these last months to a guy named Jamie Winship. For those of you who don't know who Jamie is, man, this is such an incredible story. Jamie is a Christian who worked in D.C. as a police officer for many years. And that's not even the really cool part. Jamie is, has so many incredible stories about how the Lord did amazing things in his life while he was a police officer. I want to set the background for who this guy is, and then I'll tell you this story. But back in the early 80s, it was Jamie's third year as a police officer. And one day, him and his partner got a call about a kidnapping case at a school bus stop. Now, this is back in the 80s where there were no cameras or technology or color or anything like that. Sorry to the 80s babies. To get, there was nothing. There was no technology to get a description of what the kidnapper's vehicle looked like. And there were no witnesses. And so all the police department knew was that there was an elementary school kid missing. And so to get a little more clarity on the case, Jamie met with the missing kid's father. And obviously this father, he's distraught and he's hysterical. I mean, what parent wouldn't be? And so to calm him down, Jamie does something that police officers are never trained to do. And Jamie can't help it, but he tells and makes a promise to the dad that he will find his son. And so all the police officers are searching for this kid. Helicopters are called in, perimeters are set up, and everyone is in crisis mode. And so Jamie, in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of all the panic, Jamie decides to sit down on the side of the road and do what he does best. He starts to pray. And he prays to God, God, can you tell me where this kid is? Can you talk to me in a way that I can tell others about you because you were the one that will find this kid. Can you help me find him? And so he's sitting there in the middle of the road, and this random car comes down the street. The car, it, it isn't speeding. It doesn't have any special marks. There's nothing different about this car. And all of a sudden, Jamie felt like someone punched him in the stomach, and he starts feeling nauseous, and he hears the Lord say, hey, the kid you're looking for, he's in that car. And Jamie's like, I'm sorry, what? The kid's where? The Lord says, the kid you are looking for is in that car. And so Jamie's like, oh, okay, I'll, I prayed for this, I'll be obedient. Jamie runs to the front of the car, stops the car, and he comes up to the driver. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to need you to get out of your car, and I'm going to need you to open your trunk. The driver's all confused. Jamie's confused. And, and lo and behold, 
He opens his truck, and the missing kid is in the trunk of the car, still alive. Everyone is shocked, and the lead detective looks at Jamie, and is like, how did you do that? And Jamie's like, you're not going to like this answer. <laughs> the detective's like, no, 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 what is it? How, how, did you, how did you solve this case? And Jamie goes, well, um, it was Jesus. Jesus told me where this kid was. And the detective goes, yeah, you're right, I don't like that answer. <laughs> and that's Jamie Winship, just the background of who he is. Jamie that year got police officer of the year. Soon he got promoted. He was later recruited by the CIA, and then he became a militant peacemaker in the Muslim world. Jamie Winship is so cool. I tell you that to set the background of who this guy is. When Jamie was first starting out as a police officer, him and the other recruits were going to be, part, were going to be uh, paired with their field training officer. A field training officer is someone who's responsible for training and mentoring and, and recommending new recruits to the police department. And recruits are partnered with their training officer for 12 months before they can actually become and officially become a police officer. So field training officers can either make or break your career before it even starts. And so the goal of every recruit is to get a good field training officer. And so one night, it was pairing day. Recruits got paired up with their training officers, and all the recruits were frantically pacing, and everyone was nervous. Jamie was especially nervous because he didn't get, want to get paired up with the training officer they called the troll. Now, the troll was one of the most feared and disliked training officers in the department. The troll had a reputation for making his recruits' life a living nightmare. The troll had the highest turnover rate and the lowest acceptance rate amongst all of the field officers. And get this, in his own words, it gave him pleasure to get recruits to turn in their guns and their badges early. That night, as all the recruits are nervously waiting to get paired with their training officers. The door opens to the police station, and out comes all the officers. And leading the pack is a man who is five foot tall this way and five foot tall this way. The troll has arrived. He's here. As Jamie is standing there one by one, all the recruits get paired with their training officer, and the only officer that is left is the troll. Now, for the next 50 weeks of four-day, 10-hour shifts, Jamie was not al allowed to talk unless the troll gave him permission. He was constantly berated by the troll for his appearance, his race. The troll made crude and awful sexual remarks about him and his wife. He constantly talked about how unqualified Jamie was. He made fun of the fact that Jamie was a Christian. And at the end of every shift, the troll would ask Jamie this question. Since I don't think you'll make it, do you want to resign now? And after every single shift, when he had left the presence of the troll, Jamie's wife would ask him, how was your shift, honey? What a good wife. Jamie's answers was often, I don't think I'm going to make it. The troll is making my life miserable. Why keep trying? And so finally, one night, when Jamie couldn't take it anymore, he did what he did best. He prayed. And while he was pleading with God to remove the troll or to assign him to someone else or to save the troll, the Lord instead comforted Jamie and gave him courage and the strength that he needed, and after Jamie's prayer, Jamie said this, the only way I was able to abide with the troll throughout that agonizing years was by abiding in life union with the God who still speaks, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed to us in Christ Jesus and poured out through the Holy Spirit. Get this, every time the troll asked me a probing question, God's spirit asked the question more deeply. Every time the troll told me a risque story or offered an inappropriate illustration, 
God's spirit beautified the story and made the illustration redemptive. Every time the troll cursed or belittled me, God's spirit reminded me how much he loved the troll. And every time the troll asked me if I wanted to quit, God's spirit asked, if you quit, who's going to tell the troll that I love him? Jamie didn't quit. And when Jamie was named police officer of the year, he said he owed his success to four persons, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, and master police officer chief himself, known as the troll, all of whom who he loved deeply from the deepest part of his heart. I tell you those stories because I cannot help and see the wide contrast in how Christians suffer in the midst of persecution. There's really two ways to deal with soft persecution, and that's what we're experiencing in America right now. Soft persecution is any ridicule or mocking or pressure from the culture. We don't experience hard persecution. Hard persecution is what our brothers and sisters in countries like North Korea and China, where if you speak out about your faith, you lose your life, you lose your livelihood. We in America are experiencing soft persecution where we might get ridiculed or mocked. We don't fit in the culture. Someone might stare at us funny. That's what soft persecution is. Guys, we are moving into a time of history where we will be pushed towards more and more legitimate soft persecution for following Jesus. Right now, in 2023, we are experiencing the subtle cultural resistance for proclaiming that there's one king and his name is Jesus. And, and I just want to tell you, very softly and very kindly, it's not going to get easier to follow Jesus. We are living in a culture where it's almost agreed upon that our beliefs are, are wrong and they're backwards and they might even be hurtful to the culture. And, and all of us in our apprenticeship to Jesus have experienced or encountered someone or something like the troll where our beliefs are mocked and Jesus is made fun of, where it's hard to speak up and speak out. And, and this soft persecution has been permeating everything from, from where you work to where you study and even the relationships you currently have. And so our culture is moving further and further away from the teachings of Jesus. And so I want to warn you, there are going to be subtle yet deadly moments that our discipleship to Jesus is going to be tried and it's going to be tested. Where what we say we believe and what we actually believe are going to rise to the surface and, what, and, and they're going to collide. And so we have to either take a stand or fall backwards. And so my hope is that we would react more like Jamie and Jesus rather than these college students. And so as we move forward in time, the question is not will you, if you will be persecuted for your faith, but when you are persecuted for your faith, how will you endure? Will you come out of the fire praising God or will you crumble in the pressure of the heat? How do we as followers of Jesus have hearts and postures that expect persecution yet we do not fall away but instead endure? And so today, I believe that Acts 17 gives us, one, gives us two points on how to experience and endure persecution. You ready? Okay. I have one point today. It's three hours long. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I have one point. In this world, you are promised persecution, but it can be endured by confession, celebration, and community. In this world, you are promised persecution, but it can be endured by confession, celebration, and community. Look back at the text with me. They came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned if you want to underline that word, underline the word reason. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, and some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. 
But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Now they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, and his name is Jesus. Paul, whenever he went into a new city, it was his custom to go to the synagogue first. He had done this before, and now we're in Thessalonica, a city filled with idol worshipers and pagans. And yet Paul does not start in the marketplace or in the public square where all the sinners would be. He starts in the synagogue where all the people who claim to know God would be. Not only does he start in the synagogue, the text tells us that he was in the synagogue for three Sabbath days which would be the equivalent of three weeks. And so meaning that Paul labored and debated and reasoned in the synagogue week in and week out. Now, that might not sound important, but it's actually a really subtle hint that the author of Acts gives us. Later in the book of Thessalonians, we're told that Paul was in the city for for months, way longer than three weeks. And so what the author of Acts is doing is he's telling us to focus and to pay attention to what is happening in the synagogue and to see the ramifications it had for this small baby church in Thessalonica. The interesting thing about this story is that Paul goes into the synagogue and we are told that he does not bully or berate or make fun of those people in the synagogue. He does not belittle or mock them. Instead, the text tells us that he reasons with them. The Greek word for reason is a root for our English word dialogue. And so the belief is that scholars believe that there was an exchange of questions and answers and that there was a dialogue from the scripture. And the idea was that they would take together up the the parchments of the Septuagint and and Paul would select a passage and he would submit it and and he would get back. and, And it was just this exchange. There was almost this friendly exchange and this banter, like almost they had respect for one another. The text tells us that not only did they did he reason with them with thoughts and ideas, but that he reasoned with them from Scripture. Paul had the equivalent of three PhDs. He was trained in philosophy, reason, and rhetoric, and yet his focus was none of that. His goal was to reason or to dialogue from Scripture and Scripture alone. And so, as he's preaching and teaching, in the synagogue, some of the people of the synagogue, the text tells us they believed and they followed Paul and Silas to, to form this small house church that meets in Jason's house. And at some point of the exchange of words and ideas, this dialogue turns into an attack from some of the Jews. Scholars believe that Paul, for the first two weeks, was building this case on why the Messiah had to come and why he had to suffer. And then on the last week, he told them that the Messiah did come, he did die, and that his name was Jesus, and that if they did not repent, they would have died too in their sins. And so out of desperation, some of the Jews were so mad that they rounded up what the text calls some bad characters from the marketplace or from the rabble. And this word bad, it carries the idea of total depravity and total evil intent. And so these men were men who were always looking for trouble. They had nothing better to do. They didn't have jobs. And so out of necessity, the Jews partnered with them to form a mob and to start a riot in the city. Now, these men who were bad, bad characters, It reminds me of my favorite movie of all time. Probably the best movie ever made. Are you ready? The Dark Knight. Take that, Marvel. Whoever booed is a Superman fan. In one scene, Bruce is asking sweet, sweet, gentle, wise Alfred for advice. And he doesn't understand why the mob would team up with a man like the Joker and, and target Bruce And then sweet, gentle, wise, oh, Alfred's the best. Alfred tells Bruce this beautiful line. 
He says, you squeeze them, you hammer them to the point of desperation, and in their desperation, they turn to a man they did not fully understand. And then he finishes off by saying this iconic line. If you've never seen the movie, I feel so bad for you. He says this, because some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be fought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. And so out of their desperation, the Jews turned to men they did not fully understand. The Jews partnered with these men to form a mob, to start a riot in the city, and to stomp out this movement in the city. And the question is why? Why in their distress and in their anguish did the Jews resort to such extreme tactics? Why were the Jews willing to lie to the legal system to accomplish their goal? Why is Acts 17 also an embodiment of what you and I are going to experience and suffer? I touched on this a little bit, but look back at the text. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, and this is the key, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ, and it can be translated to is the king. In that moment, Paul was proclaiming to the Jews and to the systems, and to the standards of the world, and to the rulers of Thessalonica, and to Satan himself, that there is a new king, and his name was Jesus. And that this king, oh man, this great king, he's bringing a new kingdom. And that the king, and this is a kingdom where the poor, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, they're called blessed. Where enemies are called brothers and sisters, where the last is going to be first, where evil will be exposed, where our crowns are traded in for crowns of thorns, where the ruler of heaven and earth carried his cross and is killed for the sins of his people. The kingdom has come. Man, not only do we get to live and partake in this new kingdom, if you were a Christian, you get to live and partake in this kingdom, but you also get to be called children of the living God and heirs of the throne. And so now and forever, we get to rule with our father in this kingdom. Paul was proclaiming peace and he got persecution. Paul was proclaiming a new king and he got charged with treason. So it should not come to us as a surprise that when our hearts and our hands proclaim to the world and to the ruler of the world about this new king, that we will experience resistance and opposition from the people living in it. Dallas Willard said it like this, our cultural and social practices are under the control of Satan and thus opposed to God and to you and me. Acts 17 is the standard and example of how we need to experience and face persecution. Acts 17 is the litmus test for how persecution starts and how to endure it. And this is how it plays out for our lives as followers of Jesus in the year 2023. And this is hard. Man, I've been praying this whole week for you guys. As I was reading this text, my heart broke for you. Kelly and I have family members that we have to see throughout holidays that don't know Jesus. And if I'm being really honest with you, there are so many emotions that go into it. Sometimes Kelly and I feel feel lonely because they don't understand what we believe. I feel like sometimes they make fun of it or they make fun of the things that we do or that we don't do. Feels like the closest people in the world don't fully understand us. And we don't understand them. And so we can't go and we can't celebrate. We can't say, hey, man, these kids got baptized and so many people are coming to camp and we can't celebrate our wins and we can't grieve our losses with them. Feels like we have to walk in eggshells around them. There's this feeling of being alone and misunderstood. 
Some of you can relate. And we also live in this weird tension because we love them with all our hearts and we love them with all of our souls and our deepest desire is for them to know Christ. But if I'm being really honest, I'm afraid, and and sometimes it's kept me up at night that I don't know where they're going to end up in eternity. And so there's this weird tension because I, I love them so much, but I walk on eggshells around them, and I don't want them to die in their sin, but at the same time, I want to keep the peace. Man, I feel really bad for a lot of you at work. I, I work for a church. I hope I'm not experiencing persecution. So, so this week, man, I just I was praying that God would give you a word. And so I, I met with a bunch of you, and I just asked what your experience was like out in the workplace. And man, my heart breaks for a lot of you. Some of you work for places where what you believe is not the norm, where you have to tiptoe around certain issues, where all you want to do is love people, do your job, have fun. But if you speak up, at worst, you're going to be called a bigot. And at the minimum, you might not be called a team player. Some of you work for companies that require you to attend events that you feel really conflicted with. And you've had inner dialogues of whether to go or not and what you actually believe. And, and if you don't go, then people are going to start asking questions and, and you don't really want to answer them or know how to answer them. And, and if you do, you, and if you do go, you feel like you've compromised. Man, my heart breaks for you. This whole week, I've been praying for you. I've been petitioning for you that the Spirit would comfort you and that the Spirit would be with you and that you would not fall away. I feel like the Spirit has been telling me all this week to tell you that you are not alone, that you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that you don't fall away, but that you fall into a community and that you stand firm when persecution and suffering come. Man, my heart breaks for you. I need you to listen, and I need you not to believe the lie. You are not alone. The only way that we are going to suffer and suffer well and the only way we are going to endure is if we celebrate the pain with one another. The only way we are going to suffer well is if we dig deep into a community of strong relational ties and reject this idea of isolation. The only way we're going to suffer well is if we come together and we share our burdens and we pray for one another, if we have a safe place where we can go after spending a long week in the battlefield and we come together and we share our war stories, we're like, yeah, we got beat up a little bit. and Yeah, we might have gotten a little bit damaged and a little bit scuffed, but we're not alone. You might be in one area of Charlotte and I might be in another But man, we fight together. We fight the same battle for the same king. Man, I I pray that we would have a place where we all come together on Sunday morning and we're reminded of why we are fighting and who we are fighting for and who we are fighting against. And that we are reminded of the sacrifice that our king made for us. How this perfect king, he came to serve and to rescue, and all of our sins hung him to his creation. And so that our, and so our, our king died so that you and I, that we could be forgiven. And I want you and I encourage you to have a place where two or three brothers or sisters where you confess, yeah, yeah, we all failed this week. And I was scared and I didn't talk about my king 
And I want you to have a place where we can just wrap our arms around each other and we don't cast judgment, but cast love. Where we extend compassion to one another. I've been praying for you all this week. And I feel like I have to tell this to some of you. There are some of you in this room that have left or are wanting to leave that. There are some of you in this room that are in the midst of deconstructing or have completely deconstructed that you've subdued to the pressures of the world. Some of you have caved in that if we went to your family or to your friends, they wouldn't even know you were a Christian. Some of you, like Peter, have publicly denied Jesus. And some of you are living in sin and in open rebellion, and you don't feel close to him anymore. There are some of you struggling with that, and my heart breaks for you. And I need you to know that he is good, he is merciful, and that he is kind, and that our guilt and our rebellion was big, but the celebration of forgiveness is even bigger. I want to tell you this story, and then we'll wrap up. Martin Luther was a great German reformer, and he had a single disagreement with the great Swiss reformer, Ulrich Zwingli. They disagreed over the nature of the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther said in the Lord's Supper elements that there's the presence of Christ. More, I'm sorry. They disagreed over the nature of the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther said that in the Lord's Supper elements, there's the presence of Christ. And Zwingli said that it was more symbolic, like what we believe. They got into a warfare of written words, and it escalated and escalated and escalated until Luther was calling the great Swiss expositor a devil. And Zwingli was giving it back to Luther, and so finally the federal government, they stepped in, and they made them meet and to settle it. Luther came to this table, and Zwingli came to the table, and those 46-year-old men stood face to face, and Luther wrote on the table in shock, this is my body in Latin, and he wouldn't give an inch because that was his conviction. On the other hand, Zwingli pleaded with them. He said, please hear me out, listen. And on a Monday, those giants stood before one another for the last time. And Zwingli held out his hand in brotherhood. And they agreed on everything except, uh, essential except that. And Martin Luther froze his hand by his side. And he told the Swiss, you do not belong to the holy communion of the church. And I still think of Ulrich Zwingli. Philip Chapp says that with, with tears in his hot, eyes, admiring Luther, holding out his hand and saying, give me the hand of brotherhood. Zwingli was killed on the field of battle. It is recorded that Luther said, good, he deserved it. I feel like I'm standing here, extending my hand. For those of you who have fallen away, and I'm standing here holding out my hand and letting you know that Jesus has forgiven you and he will forgive you. I'm here to hold out my hand to tell you to don't be, don't be afraid and that he will give you strength. Don't go another day walking in shame, but be forgiven. At the day of eternity, when everything you've lost for the sake of your king, everything will be worth it when we see him again because he is worthy. Amen? Amen. Will you stand?